Hey, good morning. Let's stand together and let's sing. Let's sing praises to our Lord. up and song and worship you and 
give you praise. We pray, Father, that you'll hear our singing, that you'll hear our praise, and that you'll be pleased with all that we do. Father, we pray as we go through this service that you'll just touch us in a special way. Father, so many are sick, so many are away. We just pray, Lord, that for that day, for that time where we're all back in your house, for your church comes back as one body in, in this place. Be with us through the rest of the service. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Have a seat just for a second. Let me just welcome you. <clears throat> um, thank you for being here. Jump in and sing and, and pray and worship with us. And uh, we're glad you're back. You feeling better? All right. Um, so we're glad to have Rick back. Missy here. She's still on her 10 days. Right, well, good. Well, good. They got quarantined together too, didn't you? So let's just continue to pray for all those and, and just lift them up. And um, so thanks. If you're visiting with us, we're glad you're here. Let's stand together. And, and um, you know, this is one of those where <sighs> a year ago we'd have been walking around shaking hands, but, you know, we won't do that this morning. Just pretend you are, okay? Here we go, Tyler. One.
Well, good morning, church family. So good to see you all this morning. If you will, turn to somebody and tell them how glad you are to see them this morning. Now turn to that other person that you didn't speak to the first time and tell them, well, whatever you were thinking. We are in our third and final week of a series called Faith for Exiles. We took a little break while Rick was in quarantine, so we quarantined ourselves from the letters and jumped into a slightly different uh, take on the book of 1 Peter. And so as we've been going through, uh, a reminder in case you weren't here, our first week we looked at how Peter is writing to these Jewish exiles who have been dispersed from their home. And it's because of the persecution that is going on from the Roman government. And these Jewish Christians are young in their faith, they're struggling, and they're also facing death at every time they gather and every time they meet. And Peter is writing to encourage them, to tell them some things they must do. So the first week we looked at how Peter tells them that they must get ready, get dressed for action. Something is coming, and we, as the church, must be dressed for action as well. We also looked at that week how we must fix our eyes on Jesus. Nothing else in this world matters as long as we have our eyes fixed on Christ. And then finally, we looked at how when we have our eyes fixed on Christ, we must never look back. Just like the Israelites always looking back, going back to the time when they were enslaved in Egypt. They wanted to run back to that because they had a hot meal every single day. They didn't care about the slavery and the beatings that they were going through. They just cared about the hot meal. They were groaning and complaining, always looking back on the things that they had. We as a church must never look back. We must always keep our eyes fixed on the prize that is in front of us. Last week, the second week, we looked at how Peter is telling these Christians that they must grow up. In a lot of ways, we as a church, you as an individual may have some places that you need to grow up spiritually. Maybe it's maturity-wise. Whatever it may be, we all have room that we can grow up. In order for us to grow up, we must be rooted in Christ and nothing else alone. We must be rooted in the Word. We must build our life on that cornerstone that we just sang and declared about. And then finally, we looked at how we must embrace our identity in Christ. Nothing else in this world. Not what the world tells you that you are, but who you are in Christ. So today, we are going to be looking at what is biblical submission. This is not an exciting topic. I actually wanted to skip this section and go to something that was a little bit easier over in chapter 4. But as I wrestled with this passage this week, God would not allow me to move off from it. Even last night, just me just asking God, please, this is, this is not a fun topic to discuss. And he continued to press in. So there's somebody here that needs to hear it this morning. There's somebody here that's been struggling with these topics or with this principle that Peter is laying out before us, what biblical submission looks like. Today we're going to look at two primary key relationships. The first one is submission to unjust rulers. The second one is submission in an imperfect relationship. Now these relationships are relevant to pretty much everybody in here at one point or another, whether you're married now or whether you've never been married, whether you're divorced or whether you're widowed. It doesn't matter. Everyone in here can learn and understand from the principle that Peter is trying to teach us this morning. We all have probably felt the frustrations, especially during this time, of incompetent government policies, leaders, unjust authorities. Amen? We also, likely, during at any point in our lives, and especially those who are married, understand what it's like to be married to an imperfect person. Amen? We understand what it's like to work for an imperfect person. We understand what it's like to have imperfect parents and imperfect children. These relationships span for every single one of us. And what Peter is talking about in this section is how we biblically submit under these particular relationships. So I hope today that you understand and that you see that God is not blind to your suffering right now. Just as God was not blind to the suffering that the Jewish Christians were undergoing at this time that Peter is writing to, God is not blind to your suffering either in un- imperfect relationships or in under unjust rulers. He sees what is going on, but what is matter is not what's going on here. His suffering is part of the redemptive plan that he is working out for all of us. 
So again, these key relationships to understand suffering, we must understand submission. This is the context that Peter is writing to as they are suffering, is for him to guide them into what it means to biblically submit. Peter introduces every single one of the three relationship types. We're only going to cover two today. But in the section, he introduces every single one of those with submit. Submit over and over and over again. This is key to all three relationships that Peter talks about. We're only going to discuss two today. So Jesus is the anchor for all of these relationships. You have to understand this before we can get into understanding the two types of relationships we're going to look at today. Jesus should always be our example, yes. But when you look at this section, Peter talks about how every single thing that is in these relationships should be rooted to that cornerstone of Christ. Everything should be rooted to him. He should be our example, but even more so when we look at biblical submission, what that looks like. And as I hope you will see today. Jump with me and look in 1 Peter 2, 22 through 25. Verse 22, he says, He committed no sin, neither was deceit found in his mouth. When he was reviled, he did not revile in return. When he suffered, he did not threaten. But he continued entrusting himself to him who judges justly. He himself bore our sins in his body on the tree that we might die to sin and live to righteousness. By his wounds you have been healed. For you were straying like sheep, but now returned to the shepherd and overseer of your souls. Notice here four things that Peter is talking about Christ in the middle of his suffering and his injustice that he went through here on the earth. First thing Peter says in verse 22, he was patient. He knew that his suffering was part of God's redemptive plan of salvation. And as Rick and I have talked about on countless occasions, there are some Christians today who believe in a form of a prosperity gospel that talks about how God is here to bless you and how when you come to God, everything just runs smooth. Well, I'm sorry, but I have to submit that that's actually the opposite of the gospel. Christ didn't come to earth to be blessed by God. Christ came to earth to bear the curse of sin for you and I. First for the Jews, and they rejected him, and then it uh, went out to the rest of the world. Christ didn't come to ride in an Escalade, or to have a private jet, or to have a mansion, or to have all the wealth that this world has to offer. He rode in on a donkey, he died on a cross, and he had nowhere to lay his head. This is the Jesus of the Bible. Our Heavenly Father is not surprised by His suffering, and our Heavenly Father is not surprised by your suffering. However great or however minimal you may think it is, God is not surprised or shocked when things happen. The question is, how do we respond to it? Jesus responded in that He was patient in the middle of His suffering. The second thing that we see from Jesus is that He trusted in God's justice. In verse 23, he talks about that, how Jesus knew that he would not see justice on this earth. The justice that Jesus was looking for was not because of his earthly citizenship or his earthly ethnicity or his earthly religion. The justice that Jesus was looking for came from a heavenly father. The same for us. When the world cries out for justice because someone was, they felt like was wrongfully murdered, When the world cries out for justice because of a wrong done to a young child, abused. When the world cries out for justice based on whatever they may think it is. Justice does not come from an earthly judge. Justice comes from a heavenly father who is the only standard of justice. And this is a little opposite of what our culture likes to think and talk about right now. They want to talk about racial justice. They want to talk about social justice, ethnic justice, social class justice, whatever it may be. Look, if you put anything in front of justice, you have moved it off of the the goalpost that is God. Justice belongs to and is only defined by God. It is not defined by any human institution or any movement. Justice is defined by God. So when you are facing injustice in your relationships at work or in this world, it is not to the world that we look to satisfy our justice. It is to God and God alone. Yes, we cry out for justice to be enacted. Yes, we cry out and we mourn for when, it, when we feel like it is not. But ultimately it comes from God and God alone. 
The third thing is that Jesus kept doing good. Verse 23 talks about even when he was slandered, even when people were talking negatively about him at every turn, Jesus continued doing good. When Jesus was wronged, he didn't point out their wrongdoings. Jesus kept doing good. It is so difficult in our lives that when somebody has wronged us, for us to not turn around and try to have our own form of justice on them. It is so hard to not look at someone and try to get back at them. When you feel like they've stabbed you in the back, it's so hard not to go out and do the same and reveal something that you know about that person. This is not what Jesus did. If he is our example, which he should be, we must continue to do good. When people badmouth us and slander us, we must continue to do good. The Bible says that it turns that against them. In every situation, Jesus responded with God's grace because he knew that the justice belonged to God and God alone. And finally, Jesus looked to the cross. In verse 24, he talks about, by his wounds we are healed. And this is not how some people have twisted this verse to talk about how when you are in Christ, you have no wrong or no sickness that can ever come upon you. That's not what that verse is talking about. Look at the context. Jesus was not saved from the suffering of the cross because of his wounds. Jesus endured the suffering of the cross for yours. This is key to understanding suffering. God is not going to necessarily save you from suffering every time. God is not necessarily going to enact justice on this world every time. It's a mystery of who God is, but you must wrestle with that just as I have had to many times. This is difficult, but God did not save Christ from the cross when he could have. If you read the the Gospels, it goes over that over and over and over again. So in order to understand suffering, you have to understand biblical submission. So let us look at our two key relationships we're going to study this morning. The first one is every human authority under unjust rulers, verses 13 through 17. We see that every human authority, we must have this biblical form of submission. Verse 13 Be subject for the Lord's sake to every human institution, whether it be the emperor as supreme or to governors as sent by him to punish those who do evil and praise those who do good. For this is the will of God, that by doing good you should put to silence the ignorance of foolish people. Verse 16, live as people who are free, not using your freedom as a cover-up for evil, but living as servants of God. Honor everyone, love the brotherhood, fear God, honor the emperor. Now notice here in verse 17 that Peter does not limit the human authorities that Christians are supposed to be submissive to. He says every human institution. Everybody say every. Y'all said that like y'all were half asleep. Everybody say every. Every human institution. Now when I read the Bible, I take it literally. As Rick does. When, When the Bible says that Jesus came to say all of humanity. I, I take that literally. All. Doesn't mean all will. But he says all. That's pretty simple. When he says every, that means every. Not the ones that you or I agree with politically. Not the ones that you or I agree with of how they act. This is every human institution. Everyone that has a place of authority over you, we are called to be submissive to. Now Peter notes here That we do not do this for our own good. We don't obey our bosses at work so that we can get a raise. We don't obey our our parents because we hope that they may let us out early off of being grounded or whatever so that we can go out and do what we want to. We obey because we're doing it to obey God. This is God's standard and God's precedent. So when your boss mistreats you badly and you continue to do good just like Christ did as we saw... You don't do it for the boss. You do it for God. This is difficult because you often are under awful bosses and awful institutions that may not know how to lead you properly. We are called to obey and we are called to be submissive to them, which leads to the next big question, especially when it comes to government, which everybody has an opinion on right now. How do you submit to government leaders when you disagree with them? How do, you, how do you submit to bosses when you disagree with them? 
Maybe you disagree with them because of their policies. Maybe you disagree with them because of their lifestyle. Maybe you disagree with them because of their behavior on social media or the way that they act in public. What do you do whenever you are under somebody who is like this? Well, first, we have to realize that Peter would not have approved of the leaders, of the government authorities that he was under during this time period. In fact, if they had an actual open election, Peter and the Jewish Christians that he's writing to right here wouldn't have voted for any of the Caesars that they were under. And yet Peter is writing this saying, be submissive to these people. Let me take it a step further. Peter is writing in about 60 AD, which means that the emperor that he is under is Nero. You know, crazy Nero? Now he's, he's the third in a line of cuckoo crazy trained people. These Caesars who just go off the rails. The first one that Peter was under was Caligula. Now Caligula had his mom and brother killed to make sure that they couldn't challenge him. Caligula openly committed incest with three of his sisters. Caligula often cross-dressed and walked out in public cross-dressing. Caligula also promoted his favorite horse to be a senator and later he promoted that horse again to consul. Now I really love this. This is my, my biblical humor here. I really love this, because what do you do with that horse? You're voting in the Senate. Everybody, if you're in favor, aye. If you're opposed, nay. That's my biblical humor. This is, this is Caligula. This is who this man is. The second one was Claudius. He wasn't quite as crazy. And he handed the throne over to Nero, who Peter is riding under here. He didn't last long because when he handed the throne over to Nero, it actually means that Nero's mom went and killed Claudius so that Nero, her son, could be the emperor. And Nero was one of the most cruel and sadistic leaders of this time. One of the most cruel and sadistic of the three that we talked to, but also of Caesars of all time. He absolutely hated Christians. He did everything he could to oppose them. He intentionally set fire to Rome, or at least it was believed that he did it intentionally. He then stood on a balcony or a hilltop watching, playing his little harp. He blamed the whole thing on the Christians, only to have them rounded up for entertainment at his parties. What would he do at these parties? He would set lions loose on them with no way out so that they would be eaten by it, almost like a last man standing kind of thing. He would then take the Christians and burn them like a bonfire for fire, light for his parties. This is the Nero that Peter is writing to, talking about how we are to be submissive to our human institutions and every human authority. Look, when Jesus came, what did the Jews expect him to do? They expected him to overthrow the Roman government. They were expecting an earthly kingdom. This is not what happened, but this is what they wanted, because this is their view of the Messiah. They wanted an earthly kingdom. This is how they looked to him. The same thing for Peter. Peter is telling them, look, your kingdom may not be earthly. Your first perception of what you thought the Messiah was going to do may turn out to be a little bit different. But we are still called to be submissive to the human institution. Jesus had every opportunity to overthrow the Roman government at that time period, if that's what he wanted to do. The same is true for us. When you disagree with the government that is above you, when they have dysfunctions and problems that they need to sort out, we are not called to overthrow the human institutions that are in place over us. We are called to submit biblically. In verse 17, Peter tells us that we are called to do this with respect and honor. He recognizes that God has established the rulers that are in charge. And that office demands respect. Whether the person that is in the office deserves that respect or is respecting that place of office, the office demands respect. So we are called to treat the people in power with honor and with respect. In verse 16, Peter talks about how we should do this as free men and women. Again, just like Jesus, we don't do this out of compulsion because we have to. We do it as free men and women. We gladly submit to the authorities over us. But don't miss this, the third part, the one that you're probably all raising your, your feathers up over. We never disobey the commands of God, period. We never disobey the commands of God. When those lines are crossed, if the government were to tell us, for example, to tell this church to not preach that Jesus is the only way for salvation. 
with respect and honor and as a free man, that will not happen because I cannot go against the command of God. The same, I'm sure, would be true of Rick. We cannot disobey the commands of God. When the government has a fault and they are trying to maybe overimpose themselves on the church, we have to follow the two principles and check the third. We have to actually understand what the Word of God says in order to follow and biblically submit. Unfortunately, there are far too many Christians ready to compromise the Bible for acceptance with the world's standards. This is why you see so many churches with gay pride flags on their church. This is why you see so many churches that are bowing down to certain government institutions. They, they don't, maybe they don't understand principle number three about going against the word of God. Maybe it, they need a little bit of growing up themselves spiritually and mature to be able to understand what the word of God says about particular things. We should not be, now listen to me church, you should not be obsessed with the government's policies and the government's institutions, the things that they are going on so much that you do not talk about scripture. If your conversations with your coworkers and with your family revolve a lot more around politics than it does the gospel, you might need to check yourself, as I often have to. It is so hard right now to not talk about politics. It is so difficult right now to not be angry or frustrated at what may or may not be going on in this country. But listen, our primary responsibility is not to run a government. Our primary responsibility is to change it through the gospel. This is what we are commanded to do. So that is our first relationship that Peter talks about. The second one is in imperfect marriages or imperfect relationships as a whole. Specifically in this, he's talking about imperfect marriages. Look in chapter 3, verse 1. Peter says, Likewise, wives, be subject to your own husbands, so that even if some of you do not obey the word, or even if some do not obey the word, they may be won without a word by the conduct of their wives. When they see your respectful and pure conduct, do not let... Do not let your adorning be external, the braiding of hair and the putting on of jewelry or the clothing you wear, but let your adorning be hidden in the person of the heart with the imperishable beauty of a gentle and quiet spirit, which is in God's sight very precious. For this is how the holy women who hoped in God used to adorn themselves by submitting to their own husbands as Sarah obeyed Abraham, calling him Lord. Are you... And you are her children, if you do good and do not fear anything that is frightening. Likewise, husbands, live with your wives in an understanding way, showing honor to the woman as the weaker vessel, since they are heirs with you for the grace of life, that your prayers may not be hindered. Now, this is a tough section. Again, I ask God not to let me preach on it, okay? This is a tough section that actually flies a lot in the face of our culture today that is very feministic in its thrust and its point in the, in the focus of this culture is going. This is God's word, not Michael's. I'm just standing up here. Before you start turning me off, I want you to understand Peter's point here. Ask it in this way, especially for the ladies in here who may not like this verse. Ladies, what, what Peter is talking about here is asking yourself the question, how do I submit to my husband in a Christ-like way? How do I submit to my husband in a Christ-like way? Now, if you look at this section, Peter is primarily talking about saved women and their husbands are not saved. There are plenty of relationships here this morning that are like that. There are plenty of you that have testimonies like that where maybe when you were first married, your husband was not a Christian. This is what Peter is primarily talking about. When you live your life in a such a way, woman, wife, that your unbelieving husband sees Jesus through you, it's because you honor him just like Christ honors you and I. You submit just like Christ submitted. This is not because of you having a particular role in a family or doing certain things at the household that they see that. It's in every single thing that you do. They see Christ in you. This is why Peter 
talks about how the husbands may be won without a word by their wives' conduct in this section. But what happens if both of you are Christians? Which surely by the time as Peter is writing, some of them are. Surely in your relationships, both of you are Christians. The same, through, same thing is true of you. How am I submitting to my husband in a Christ-like way, in a Christ-like manner? How do you respond like Christ in a moment where somebody you has wronged you, or when you think that somebody has wronged you? How do you submit like Christ when your husband has failed to wash the dishes, you sent him to the grocery store with a list, and he still comes home with the wrong things? How do you submit to your husband when you could just keep filling in the blank? Now, this is, again, very difficult because this flies in the face of our culture. A lot of people don't want the submit part in marriage vows. A lot of people don't like this word because it makes them feel like they are supposed to be some kind of lesser. Now, husbands, don't don't miss this because in verse 7, Peter talks about you. Likewise, husbands, live with your wives in an understanding way, showing honor to the woman as the weaker vessel. That's a dangerous one. I'm not even going to get close to that one. Call me after if you want me to. Since they are heirs with you of the grace of life so that your prayers may not be hindered. Now, men, the ladies had a question they had to ask themselves. How do I submit to my husband in a Christ-like way? Husbands, you also have a question to ask. What does it mean to love and honor my wife in a Christ-like way? A lot of men in our culture don't have a good understanding of what this means either. Biblical submission. Husbands are called to submit and wives are called to submit. Maybe in different forms or in different areas, but both are called to submit a lot of people still have a view of marriage of the husband comes home after making the, the bread, bringing home all the money, and they sit on the couch and they shake their empty tea glass and tell the woman to go tell, to, to make them a sandwich. Now, don't start throwing stuff at me. That's what, not what I'm saying the Bible is saying here. This is what some people view marriage as. This is not what Scripture teaches. Scripture teaches that both men and women are equally created in God's sight. Scripture teaches that both have equal value and dignity and worth. But biblical submission means that we should not use the power that one, one or each of us have in order to manipulate, in order to control another person. No, no, no. It's talking about how we are supposed to use the power that God has given us to bless and to serve. It talks about in this section, women, you have a certain beauty that men do not. Amen? You have certain ways that God has blessed you with beauty in your hair and your makeup or I, what, I, what Rick and I call war paint. Whatever you choose to do, you have beauty that you can use to bless your husband that should be reserved only for your husband if you were single in here this morning. And men, you have power both physically and as the head of your household. That does not mean that you should control and manipulate your wife or the women around you. Biblical submission looks nothing like what the world may define as roles in marriage. The authority and the, and the structure that God has provided, while both men and women are equally created and equally dignified in God's sight, there is an order and a structure and a hierarchy. Why? Because it mimics God. This is the order and the structure that God has established and placed in effect. Men are called to lead. That doesn't mean that they should use their power to get what they want. Husbands, you should never pull out this passage of Scripture or others that it talks about and pull out the, you must biblically submit to me, woman. That's not the card that you should pull out. This is not what Scripture is talking about. I love the way that C.S. Lewis said this. C.S. Lewis said that the crown a man wears in marriage is the first one of thorns. The crown that the man wears in marriage is the first the one of thorns. If we are to mimic Christ and follow his biblical submission, this means that in my leadership role in our marriage, I willfully and voluntarily lose 90% of the disagreements Amy and I have. She may think she wins, but I willingly lose 90% of the disagreements that we have. Because it is submitting to her. It is leading in a proper way. If I'm leading in a Christ-like way, I let Amy have her preferences. Not because 
It's hopeful that I get something after. It's not because I'm hopeful that maybe I can store up enough, enough good in the bank so that she will let me buy a new gun or a, a part for a truck. It's not any of those things. This is because of the way that God honors and models submission. This is why every year when Valentine's Day rolls around, you see a bunch of men doing a whole lot of great things for their wives. Absolutely, we should shower our wives with praise, and we should shower the women in our lives, our moms or whoever it may be for you. We should shower them with love, but it shouldn't be just for Valentine's Day and you go right back to the couch shaking your tea glass for the rest of the year. This is not biblical submission. I know as ridiculous as this may sound to some of you in here this morning who have been married longer than I have been alive. This is God's word, not coming from just me. I understand that a lot of you have gone through seasons that I will never face. A lot of you have gone through heartache and hurt in marriages and relationships that I have never faced. This is not about a personal experience. This is about a biblical principle. Wives, you are called to submit to your husbands. And the husbands don't lord that power over you. The husbands willfully submit to you. It is a constant cycle. This is just how it has to be. And I understand a lot of you women in here are strong and independent. I understand a lot of you women in here are very much have your opinions I get that. You express them with me often. You express them with your husbands often. They're just trying not to shake their heads so you don't punch them after. That is okay to be strong and independent. Husbands that are sitting in here this morning or men that are single sitting in here this morning, you have a place of authority in your household. If you don't lead, she will. That's not to say that that's wrong or that's bad. What was the fall when Adam and Eve committed the sin? God didn't get on to Eve because she was doing something that she should have been doing, leading. God got on to Adam because he wasn't doing the duty that he called her to do. When God cursed Adam and Eve, he said to the woman that your when, when the curse of sin comes upon you, you will have the authority, or you, you will feel like you have the authority to overturn your husband. That is the effect of sin. This is how things go. My prayer in here for everyone today is not to hear the, the negative side of biblical submission, but to hear the positive beauty that we should see in a biblical marriage and in understanding how to biblically submit to the human authorities that are above us so that people will see Jesus through our relationships. People will see Jesus through your relationships with your spouse, with your co-workers, with your friends, with every single person that you come in contact with. My prayer is that they see Jesus through your submission, not as weak individuals, but it's meekness, it's power under control. You have the power and the authority to do maybe a whole lot of different things than what you are currently doing, but you are submitting because that is what God has called you to do. If we are going to have the faith for exiles that Peter is talking about here, and if we are going to show people who Jesus is every single day in our lives, we need to have a good form of biblical submission. And I hope this has challenged you. I hope this spurs on conversations in your home of what this looks like. And if you have questions, please come and ask. Let's stand and pray. Father God, I pray for every one of these families in here this morning. God, I pray that we will learn to submit. When it's hard, when it's difficult, when we may not like the decision that somebody is making, we have opinions and we have thoughts. And it's great to express those in a loving and Christ-like way. But God, I pray for every single person in here this morning that ultimately they will see you, not our opinions. They will see your love not our anger or our frustration. They will see your sacrifice rather than our pride and our agenda. God, I pray for every single person in here when it is so easy right now to be consumed with political talks that we will be consumed much more by your love and your grace and the gospel. I pray for every conversation that we have will be transformed into your image. 
so that people will see you through us. God, it is in your holy and precious name we pray. Amen.